Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Barry Sapelowitz from Garfunkel Wild uh, speaking to you today about a um, an important topic um, that is, um, I think, important to all physicians, regardless of whether the physicians are starting out the practice or they're well into their practice or they're in their last years of practice. Um, your medical record, which is a business record, um, has been this, uh, an issue um, um, and a, an important uh, topic in terms of exposure to liability since I've been practicing law. But over the past uh, several years, we've seen how the medical record has been used against physicians and their practices in, uh, in other ways. And uh, I thought this would be an, uh, an opportune time to speak with you about uh, medical records and give you some anecdotes about how I've seen uh, third parties use medical records uh, against uh, physicians and perhaps uh, you know we can take some take-home messages to uh, improve medical record taking so that your exposure to liability um, is reduced. Um, I want to thank the Fairfield County Medical Association, uh, Mark Thompson for uh, helping to arrange um, uh, this uh, webinar and I also want to thank you for taking the time out in your busy day uh, to listen to this uh, program. Um, just as a matter of housekeeping, um, uh, a copy of this presentation um, will be sent to all of the attendees um, over the next few days. Uh, you also will be provided a link uh, to the Garfunkel Wild website uh, so that you can review the presentation. Um, and certainly um, at the end of this webinar, um, I'll provide you with some time to ask uh, questions. Uh, you'll have to type the questions you know, at, uh, on your laptop or on your computer. Uh, the questions are anonymous. so. Um, ask any question um, uh, you would like, and um, if you, for some reason, uh, want to ask me a question after the webinar is over, feel free to send me uh, an email at my uh, at my email address, which is bsapelowitz at garfunkelwild uh, com. Just by way of background, um, I am a physician as well as an attorney. I'm a partner here at Garfunkel Wild. Garfunkel Wild. Um, um, is a, a firm of over 80 attorneys, and we specialize in healthcare. Uh, many of you on this program have uh, probably have worked with us in some capacity. Um, and a lot of the work that I do is that I represent physicians as well as other healthcare professionals um, in audits or whenever there's a complaint or an investigation or a litigation. Um, and many, many times, the direction that these complaints or investigations or litigations take depend on the on the medical records themselves so which is why i think this is an important topic we have seen more and more audits over time uh by state and federal uh agencies uh we have seen dph becoming very active in uh you know investigating positions for various uh, acts or omissions um and of course with the opioid crisis and with all the controlled substance uh, issues we are hearing about uh, doctors who do prescribe these medications, uh, they may be investigated and the medical records are one of the top areas that the investigators look at. So again, the issue of medical records can impact, depending on the findings, uh, can impact the licensure status of the physician, uh, can impact your medical staff privileges, can impact you know your employment, many employment agreements that you have with your groups uh, or with the hospital systems do contain provisions that require you, the physician to maintain accurate and complete medical records. Um, and certainly if you lose your license or you are suspended or you have to pay a penalty or a fee, um, that could be grounds of termination uh, of your employment. So really the purpose of today's program is to um, assist you in thinking about your medical record as a business record um, so that you can create a document, whether it's electronic or paper, uh, that would protect you and your practice in the event of an audit uh, complaint or an investigation or litigation. So the first issue is, you know, do we have adequate or inadequate medical records? And I use the word inadequate in quotes because unfortunately, the, you know, back in the old days when I was in medical school, we were told that, you know, the purpose of, of keeping a record or, or and producing a medical record is so that um, another healthcare professional, another physician who would review the record, uh, either in your absence or as a, re as a referral, they could see what you did or didn't do, and they can they can continue with the treatment of the of the of the patient. Today, these medical records are much more than that. Today, medical records are being viewed by people who are not physicians 
or who may be physicians of different specialties. So, for example, if you're being investigated by a third-party payer or, or by a state or federal agency, um, and you're a dermatologist, it won't be necessarily a dermatologist that's reviewing your record. It could be a physician of some other specialty, or it may even be a non-physician. And these are the people who are determining whether your medical records are adequate or not. And if they determine that your medical records are inadequate, then obviously our our job um, working with you, it would be to show that the records were in fact more than adequate. But if they come up with a, a determination that your records are inadequate in some way, these may lead to findings um, of either medical malpractice if you're in a court uh, or of you know professional misconduct if, if you're in front of DPH uh, or billing fraud if you're in front of the Department of Insurance or third party payers or sometimes even in front of uh, uh, federal law enforcement. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people ask me, you know, when, when is it that our medical records are being viewed? You know, what, what triggers an audit? And usually there, there are a variety of reasons. Uh, many times we see that if we have a disgruntled employee, you've terminated an employee from your practice and you did so rightfully for the appropriate reasons, um, that employee may all of a sudden in, in, in retaliation may all of a sudden become a whistleblower, um, report, you know, the practice to DPH or to some other uh, agency and now all of a sudden you, you find yourself being investigated. Um, a second um, um, uh, uh, entity that likes to do a lot of these audits, of course, are third-party payers. Many times third-party payers will launch an audit um, of, of, of the practice and of the medical records because they there's allegations that um, certain treatments or procedures were not medically necessary or that the doctor was upcoding. And so they start looking at the medical records. They conduct their audit. Um, for whatever it's worth, and they come back with findings that the medical records are inadequate in some way. And a third area where we see, um, you know, a, a reason why there's been an uptick in a lot of these audits is when a patient wants to sue a doctor because they feel that they have not been treated uh, appropriately and they go to um, a, a bunch of medical malpractice attorneys, the, the attorneys look at the, at, the, at the situation and they come up with a determination that there's really nothing here to sue the doctor about, there is no medical malpractice, and as you may know, um, most of the plaintiffs' attorneys, they do uh, their cases on contingency, so they're not going to they're not going to bring a lawsuit on something that um, may be a poor return on their on their investment. And so, at some point in time, one of the med mal attorneys would tell the patient, "You know what? You may not have a med mal case here, but why don't you file a complaint with DPH? DPH will investigate the physician, and what better what better you know um, you know uh, retaliation can you take against this physician?" than the loss or the suspension of his or her license. So a lot of times we see that, you know, uh, patients who really cannot sue because there is no medical malpractice, they'll basically start filing complaints and sending letters to DPH and other um, agencies to hopefully uh, launch an investigation against that doctor so they can take action against that doctor. And that's their way of, you know, of getting back at the physician. So it's unfortunate, but we've seen a lot of this uh, happen. So depending on how they come back, how the whoever is investigating your records, how they come back, they could, you know, they could basically uh, invoke um, various penalties, whether they're civil penalties, uh, such as fines or criminal penalties based on allegations of fraud. We have seen civil cases become criminal um, if you're in a medical malpractice case and your records are not deemed to be sufficient. And clearly the plaintiff's lawyer is going to try to use this to um, his client's advantage it may end up with greater settlements or plaintiff's verdicts. Uh, if you're in front of a third party payer and your medical records are not um, you know, comprehensive and complete, it could result in greater refunds to third party payers. And if you're in front of DPH, it could result obviously in the worst case scenarios, which are suspension or revocation um, of your license. And again, these are any of these are, 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 are terrible uh, results and our goal would be to prevent any of these uh, from happening. And again, if you have an employment agreement, uh, with a with a group or with a system, any of these things could probably end up being considered to be a breach of your employment agreement and result in not only termination, but if your employment agreement, if the doctor's employment agreement has an indemnification provision, then that doctor may end up having to pay the uh, the practice or the system the damages that the practice or the system have to pay as a result of um, of the investigation. So, for example, if um, if there's a third party payer audit. And as a result of the medical record keeping, now the practice has to pay $30,000 to the third party payer. That practice now, if there's an indemnification provision um, in the contract, they can go to the doctor and say, you have to pay us the $30,000, you have to indemnify us 
and uh, make us whole. So the key concepts to remember, and again, some of these are not new. I mean, if it isn't written, it wasn't done. This has been a phrase that has been used by plaintiff's attorney, uh, by plaintiff's attorneys in medical malpractice cases for, for many, many years. Um, but it's also the position that every other person who investigates takes as well. So whether they're third party payers or the OIG or the attorney general's office, they always come back and they say to the physician or to us, you know, if it wasn't written, then it clearly it wasn't done. Um, we see a lot of this in the informed consent uh, milieu, and we'll talk about that um, uh, shortly. But again, what's also important is that the records must be legible. Um, clearly, if they're paper records, they have to be legible. If they're EMR, uh, that may not be such an issue. But they have to be accurate. They have to be complete. They have to be timely, and they have to be objective. And that applies for EMR. Much of what we're saying, to, much of what we're talking about today, will apply to both traditional paper records as well as to electronic medical records. So if you basically have records, it's important that you, you accurately and contemporaneously you know, write your records. People ask me, what does contemporaneously mean? Lots of times doctors will say, well, you know, I'm very busy during the day. Um, I, I see 30, 40 patients during the day. I typically don't write uh, my records you know, uh, on the spot, although with EMR now, that may be a little bit different. Um, and so usually I, I, I do, I write my records over the weekend or sometime, you know, uh, you know, later, later in the week or perhaps even uh, beyond that. And that's not a good idea. Um, frankly, I can't remember what I did yesterday. So uh, for, for a physician to write what he or she did or said to the patient, you know, two or three days out, I think um, could reduce uh, the quality of the record and, the, and how comprehensive and accurate the record is. So I always suggest that the record be done literally that same day. Um, people also ask me, you know, Barry, you know, you're, you're giving a lot of advice. You're telling us to do a lot of these things. We can't spend an hour on each encounter. We can't spend an hour on each patient. And I'm not suggesting that you spend an hour on each patient. But what I'm suggesting is that if you, if you spend three, four, or five minutes writing your record, um, and we'll, 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 this will be a, a reoccurring theme, you look at that record and you say to yourself, well, in two or three years from now, when I'm being asked to defend my treatment of this patient on this particular day, and I look at this record, will it basically refresh my recollection enough so that I will be able to respond and say exactly what I did, why I did what I did, what I didn't do, why I didn't do what I didn't do. And, and if, you're, if your answer is yes, I think the record will be able to do that for me, then fine, then you, then you may have a, a, a good, accurate, comprehensive record. But if the answer is no, maybe not, then you have to think, okay, what else do I need to add here so that if, if I don't have any recollection of this, of this event in a couple of years, then the record will help me uh, because there's nothing better than a contemporaneous record um, that was written at you know on or around the time that you saw the patient. By way of um, uh, going into a tangent, you know today with EMR, a lot of doctors when they see their patients, they bring a tablet into the um, into the examination room and and they start actually doing their medical record at the time they see their patient. Interestingly enough, when you ask a lot of patients why they sue their physicians in, on medical malpractice. We've been hearing more and more uh, that patients will say that the patient came in, the doctor came into my, to the examining room, you know, with his or her iPad, never looked, you know, up at me, just was, you know, the face was in their tablet. Uh, they were asking me a whole bunch of questions that clearly were on their, uh, on their template, pressing with a pencil or a pen, you know, they're the, making the, right, the correct check marks. And for all intents and purposes, they didn't even know I existed. So um, it's important that while perhaps creating an EMR at the time of the encounter may be as contemporaneous as you can be. Um, it should be done in a way where you do look at the patient, you do, you do basically look at the patient's face and you, and you connect with the patient. Don't let your face be in that tablet the whole time because that, that doesn't go well with the, uh, with the patient. And again, the key here is when you basically put down your chief complaints, your past medical history, your exams, your allergies, your medications, your tests, your procedures, results, consultations, and all that, you're basically writing a medical record. You're preparing a medical record for two sets of people. One are healthcare professionals who are looking at these records so they can know what to do with this patient on a going forward basis for whatever reason, or people who are not necessarily healthcare professionals who are evaluating the quality of your record and they want to know exactly what you did. So you are writing for two different audiences. You're writing for a lay audience and you're writing also for your sophisticated physician audience. And so, Obviously, the lay audience has to see more 
than what you would do for your sophisticated physician audience. And that's what you have to remember when you're writing your records. Because at the end of the day, when you are justifying the quality of your records, it will not probably be to a physician in your specialty. It will be to people who are non who are non physicians. And the more you can write down, the more you can show them in the record that everything was there, that justified the medical necessity, that justified the claim, that justified the coding, the better off uh, you will be. So again, we'll discuss emails um, in, in, in a few minutes, but um, um, you know, telephone consultations. I always tell doctors, you know, they should include uh, telephone consultations, if, especially if they're material or they're substantive. Um, if it's just to schedule something, okay, fine. You don't have to necessarily uh, memorialize that in the, in, the, in the record, but certainly anything involving the, the diagnosis, the treatment, the uh, procedures, recommendations, any sort of material telephone consultation that you have uh, with a patient should be memorialized, should be dated and memorialized in your medical record. There are numerous times when we're in front of DPH um, in Connecticut or DOH, uh, OPMC in New York, um, you know, a lot of what uh, the patient will allege against the physician will have taken place in a phone conversation, and those sometimes or many times are actually not memorialized in the record, and we're down to a he said, she said. So to the extent that you have any conversation on the telephone, not just the physician, but also the staff or whoever's speaking with the patient, and it's considered to be something above and beyond just scheduling, you know, um, uh, um, you know a, a visit, uh, that should be memorialized in the record. Certainly if the patient is complaining, certainly the patient has issues, has questions, that certainly must be memorialized. Um, I'm often asked about photographs and videos. A lot of times plastic surgeons and dermatologists, you know, will take photographs and videos of, of, of their patients. Um, and really you should get the patient's consent before you do that. And um, a lot, many times I'm asked, well, can I discard the photographs can I discard the video? If my medical record describes what I've seen and what I've done, and I really don't need the photograph, I don't need to retain it, as well as the video, can I discard it? And my, and my answer is, well, if you think you're not going to retain them, you have to let the patient know, because you don't want to be in a situation where you take a photograph, you do a video, the patient will remember that, okay, and then all of a sudden there's a complaint, and the patient will tell the investigator, by the way, there were photographs or videos, and then all of a sudden you're explaining why you discarded them. I was doing a study or I was doing some analysis. I, it wasn't really necessarily important for the actual diagnosis and treatment of the patient at hand. So there was no reason why I had to keep it. Um, if that's what's going to happen, you should notify the patient. It should be part of the consent form and the patient should sign it. Um, a thing that was, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, uh, in the old days when doctors would write notes and they would see the patient with some degree of regularity, and, and the patient's condition or what the, the patient's past medical history or chief complaint doesn't, didn't really change much. Um, a, a lot of times, the, uh, whether it's a nurse or whether it's a PA or, uh, or the physician himself or herself, they would write no change, same as before, see note of, see note of prior visit, and that's not a good idea. Um, as a matter of fact, we've had situations where we've had doctors, uh, for example, psychiatrists, who would see a patient repeatedly over, um, over the week, three or four times during the week, um, almost you know once or two weeks every month, would hear the same uh, issues, and that psychiatrist would write, you know, same as above, same as prior note, and, and, and when there was a change, either there was a new complaint or a new issue, or there was a change in medication or dosage or, or, or refills, the psychiatrist would include all that in their new notes. So the psychiatrist thought that, um, you know, he was actually, you know, incorporating a comprehensive medical record when, in fact, he was being investigated at, at some point by the, um, uh, the attorney general's office for, uh, for, for on, on basis of fraud. The attorney general took the position that see the prior note, see the prior visit, no change. That basically meant you didn't do anything. And if you bill that patient or you bill the insurance company, you bill for a non-service. And so... You know, that's something that you should stay away from. And we, we see that a lot with EMR, but, but, but a little bit differently. With EMR, we see a lot of what's called cloning, a lot of cutting and pasting, where uh, physicians will essentially cut and paste what they had in a prior encounter and put it in their new date. And a lot of times it will have the same typos. A lot of times it will have information that really was not relevant to the chief complaint on the second encounter. And this is what basically the investigators latch on to when they see the cutting and pasting and they see the cloning. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the EMRs, what they do is they regurgitate a lot of the past medical history, review of systems, social history. So every time you look at every encounter, there's a lot of information at, at every encounter. But clearly, um, you know, a lot of times they're dated and you could see that actually these questions were not asked 
uh, during that particular date. They were asked maybe six months ago or a year ago because that particular EMR program continuously regurgitates at every encounter. And I always encourage the doctor or the nurse or whoever is basically preparing that portion of the medical record to add additional information, um, which you're allowed to do in most EMR systems, to show that you weren't just restricted to the template, you just didn't regurgitate what was in a prior uh, encounter, but you did ask other questions, you did get some information that was considered to be material or substantive, and you included it um, in the record. I think the more you actually include outside the template, the more it shows that you were not governed by a template, the more it shows, the more we can show an investigator that you weren't just clicking the boxes and putting checks where, um, you know, just for the sake of putting a check. So informed consent, you know, depending on what um, uh, kind of a practice you have, informed consent is, is, is an important issue. I always like to bring it up. Uh, my, my feeling about informed consent is for one, uh, you know, the healthcare professional, the, uh, the doctor should always be uh, directly involved, uh, should not delegate it really to others. If the doctor is performing the procedure, if the doctor is, prov is providing the service that requires informed consent, it really should be the doctor uh, who is involved in some capacity in, in providing the information. And the, and the informed consent should, you know, disclose the benefit, risks, and alternatives. We don't need to do a PDR. We don't need to um, uh, disclose every single benefit, every single risk or alternatives. But certainly those that are significant, those that are material, those are that are important in making the decision. Um, and again, you know, a lot of times informed consents, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, practices uh, use templates. And again, um, I'm not a big fan of templates. Um, you, the informed consent that you write by hand or that you type in doesn't have to be very, very long. It should include the key risks, uh, the important alternatives. If the patient asks any questions, it's great to have those questions in the informed consent. The patient asked me about this and this, and I advised them of that you know, of this and this, and it's, it shows that you actually had an interaction. It wasn't just some, you know, streaming of, 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 of information uh, from you to the patient, but the patient actually did digest the information, asked follow-up questions. Um, if there are witnesses present, family members, um, it's always nice to have a notation that they were there. If they ask questions, write down those questions. A lot of times, you know, with a good informed consent, and I'm not talking about something that's pages long, it could even be a half a page, but a nice, good, informed consent a lot of times can be very, very valuable uh, later on. So again, uh, just coming back to the same uh, theme, who is the record for? Yes, it is the traditional answer. It is for other treating healthcare professionals, uh, but it is also for third-party payers, a judge and a jury in a med mal case, um, a DPH, the Office of the Attorney General, the FBI, the AG, you know, it, it's for a whole bunch of other uh, people and entities who have nothing, uh, who have really uh, very limited medical knowledge. So this is probably one of the more important slides anecdotally when I deal with the, with entities that are investigating medical records. Where, where, do, where do I see some of the biggest gaps in, in medical record keeping? Um, the real number, the first bullet I think is, is important. You know, there, there needs to be a, when you basically have a medical record that has the chief complaint, the past medical history, the HPI, the exam, the diagnosis and treatment, you know, while these are separate components of the of the record, there has to be a flow from one component to the next. So, for example, and this is a an example that's real; it's not a hypothetical. We've had a situation where a a, a patient comes in um, with a chief complaint of uh, of headache and blurry vision. Okay, so right away you're thinking, uh, you know, a neuro exam. And if you look down at the bottom of the uh, to the recommendations, it's for an endoscopy. Okay, so you know, obviously, um, you know. I'm a physician, and I'm sure there are physicians, you know, in the audience, but certainly a non-physician, the first question they're going to say is, well, how is it that you go from a chief complaint of a headache and blurry vision that you go to a, uh, to an, uh, uh, you know, a colonoscopy or a lower endoscopy? And when you ask the physician, the physician will say, well, the patient came in with a chief complaint of a headache. Um, I did a neuro exam. Uh, by the way, the neuro exam was never documented. And the doctor says, well, I always do a neuro exam when they come in with neurologic symptoms. But the doctor, for whatever reason, did not put the neuro exam. But on doing a physical exam and on, on palpating the abdomen, uh, the doctor felt a potential mass uh, and basically felt that the patient should go to for a GI consult and have an endoscopy. Okay, so now I can see how you go from a chief complaint of a headache to an endoscopy, but the record did not document that. So what happens when somebody from the outside looks at this record, they think basically that you are providing either medically unnecessary procedures or referring them for medically unnecessary tests. Are you getting a, you know, in return for this referral to the GI consultant, are you getting a kickback of some sort? I mean, the outside investigators will come up with a whole milieu of allegations to justify why they think this was a bad, a bad thing that you did. And so again, you know, when, when a patient comes in with a chief complaint, that chief complaint has to be addressed in all of the components 
that follow. And if you happen to find something incidental that was not part of the chief complaint, that's okay. Start then memorialize that and continue that going forward until you know until the final section of the medical record. But again, the reader who doesn't have the benefit of being there with you and the patient, they have to look at the record and understand exactly how you went from chief complaint, you know, to diagnosis and treatment by reading the record. And again, you know, this may be a situation where if you if they come to you two or three years down the line, you may not even remember, uh, you know, th this incident with any with any clarity. And now you're governed by your medical record, which you know may be deficient. Okay, um, why your record support codes that are used? Um, that's important. Lots of times, you know, doctors will say to me that you know uh, they are an outlier. Uh, they they are highly specialized practices that see the more difficult cases. Um, you know, and as a result of that, they perform certain procedures, they perform certain tests, um, you know, they, they will refer the patients to certain specialists, um, they do things very differently, and, and, and again, that may all be true, um, but that doesn't win the day for uh, an outside investigator to understand whether something was medically necessary, whether a procedure or a referral was appropriate. So you have to explain why this patient, who may have seen other doctors and now is coming to you, why you did what you did, why you didn't do what you didn't do, why you're referring this patient for a procedure, just saying that I have, I, I get the most difficult cases, that's not going to help. As a matter of fact, uh, usually the, the, whether it's the Department of Justice or the AG or the third party payers, they get turned off by those comments. They, you have to show in the encounter why you did what you did uh, for that particular patient. So again, all conversations should be included, why you ordered a more expensive test, why you ordered uh, several consultations or unusual consultations. We see, this, we see this being problematic, for example, if you have, a, if you have a, um, uh, uh, an office, you have a medical office and you basically um, uh, sublet um, a portion of your office to a, uh, a gastroenterologist and you're referring your cases to that GI doctor for certain procedures, well, here's a doctor, here's a gastroenterologist that you have a financial relationship with. Um, you're a landlord, they're a tenant, uh, they pay you uh, hopefully a fair market value lease. And now all of a sudden, if the outsider basically see that you're making these referrals to this subtenant gastroenterologist, what are they going to say? They're going to say that you're making these referrals to get a kickback of some nature, um, you know, um, because you have a financial relationship with that gastroenterologist. So again, this may be, uh, this kind of a situation may not exist with every referral that you have that close a relationship, but it does happen with a degree of regularity where it's important to mention. So again, you know, obviously with, um, uh, with the opioids and the controlled substances, you know, what you're hearing about in the news and you're reading about, uh, we are now in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very, very critical situation where, uh, you know, uh, doctors are being examined, they're being closely scrutinized as to why, um, you know, they may have prescribed a certain uh, controlled substance or why they uh, may have prescribed a certain dosage or a certain number of refills or why maybe they didn't do a certain amount of follow-up. Uh, it's not just the big, you know, companies that are being investigated. It's also the physicians, their practices, and, and hospital systems. And the consequences can be just as, you know, um, uh, can be uh, fraught with disaster. They could be criminal penalties. Uh, there could be loss or suspension of your license or exclusion from, uh, from you know, government programs. And the investigations, um, they could be both on the federal and, and on the state level. And look at who you're dealing with. You're dealing with the Department of Justice or the OIG. You're dealing with um, local police. You're dealing with the uh, uh, Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. Um, so you're dealing with a lot of uh, heavy hitters here. And you have to be in a position where you need to have a medical record, assuming you are, uh, you are engaging in pain management of some sort and you are prescribing these um, uh, controlled substances. You have to create a medical record that's going to protect you in the event suddenly you're um, your prescribing um, uh, activities are being questioned by somebody. Even whether, it, whether it's frivolous, a patient is getting back at, at practice for some reason, or you know, it's, it's an investigation that's being launched on the outside by uh, state or law enforcement, you have to create a record that um, can corroborate what you did for that patient. So certainly, if you are treating a patient and the patient is you know, speaking to you and you are skeptical as to why this patient is asking for these, you know, controlled substances. 
does the patient's story seem right? You know, is the patient saying that his or her medication was stolen? Um, when, you, when you're asking the patient if you can speak with other, um, you know, healthcare providers who are treating the patient, if the patient says, I'd rather uh, not have you uh, speak to these people, these are things that, you know, should set off warning bells, um, you know, in your head. And to the extent that you are skeptical, uh, these should be memorialized in the record to say, look, you know, I've asked the patient X, Y, and Z. This is what the patient responded. You know, we'll follow up in, in, in two weeks or in one week to see, you know, um, you know, um, uh, to, just to do a follow-up and to see how comfortable uh, I am uh, with the process. And so typically when, you know, when any of our, our, our doctors are being uh, investigated, you know, or, or to, even if, if they're not being investigated, you know, we, we basically try to give them some, uh, you know, ideas of, of, of preventing, you know, a, a, a problem in the event they are investigated. We always uh, tell them that, you know, if you are dealing with, with uh, patients who have pain management problems, maybe it's not a bad idea to refer them, refer them, these patients to um, other specialists who have, you know, a higher degree of special uh, of experience and knowledge, um, you know, and experience with, you know, treating pain management. Again, it shows that you're willing to uh, talk to other healthcare professionals about treating this uh, this patient with these controlled substances. It's very important to talk to the patient about how to store and dispose of the medications because clearly if they don't dispose them correctly, well, why not? Are they selling it on the street? Are they giving it to somebody else? Um, you should have screening tools to identify potential abusers and to educate the patients. Um, it's always a good idea to communicate with pharmacists. And, and of course, you enter into a patient medications agreement where you identify where, you know, where the patient has to comply with your policies and protocols to continue getting these controlled substances. And the real key thing here um, is that all of this has to be documented, okay? If you can show, you know, whoever's investigating you that you have contemporaneous documentation that address these issues, it could be of tremendous help. It may not win the day because there may be other layers of issues we would have to address, but having a record that actually addresses these issues are very, very important. Now, again, this may be something that some of you or none of you or many of you may be interested in, but um, we do, we're doing a lot more work with telemedicine, um, and more and more uh, healthcare professionals are getting involved in telemedicine. And many times I am asked, well, you know, how does a telemedicine record, you know, what is a telemedicine record, what should, could it consist of? How is it any different than a traditional EMR uh, or paper record? Um, and, and the answer is, well, there are a lot of similarities, it's still a patient record, but there are certain differences. Clearly, you know, the consultant's location, the patient's location, um, that's important to be there. The names of all the individuals participating in the encounter, um, informed consent. Informed consent is very, very important. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, uh, Connecticut in, uh, has a law that basically requires that the, um, that the telehealth provider um, provides an informed consent to the uh, to the patient during the first telemedicine encounter that describes the, the limitations of the treatment, the risks, the appropriateness of the treatment, all of the, and that this should all be documented. So under, under Connecticut law, uh, you are required to give an informed consent during the first telehealth encounter. Um, but even if you didn't have this law, and many, many jurisdictions, many states um, that, um, that are friendly towards telemedicine do have an informed consent procedure, um, but it's important to have an informed consent because telemedicine adds an additional component, uh, you know, that has additional risks, may have additional benefits, um, and, and these should all be discussed um, uh, with, the, uh, with the patient. Uh, similarly, um, uh, the telemedicine record should consist of all these things. Again, you know, uh, the HPI, the review of systems, the, the uh, family and social history, evaluation, diagnosis, a lot of these are going to be in your traditional record, but also things that are important, and again, um, um, the, these, these ideas that I have for a telemedicine record, what should be in the content, um, you know, um, I, I got from uh, various telemedicine associations, various requirements by third-party payers or Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, may have certain requirements as to if you want to get reimbursed, what your telemedicine record uh, should consist of. So, so for example, um, the length of time of the encounter. Now, granted, this could be in a traditional record too, um, but again, in a telemedicine encounter, it, it, should, be, uh, it should be noted that specifically the, the amount of time that you're counseling and coordinating care. A lot of third-party payers uh, would like to have that for reimbursement purposes. Uh, coordination of care is very, very critical. Um, if, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who, who do telemedicine or are critical of telemedicine, you know, the, the first thing they can latch on to, other than the medical malpractice concerns, are, is there a coordination of care? I mean, when you have all these various uh, doctors who are treating a patient via telemedicine, 
who has all the information? Is there one is there one doctor that has all the information from all these telemedicine encounters? And that is critical. And so you have to document that there is coordination of care. And um, and again, under Connecticut law, uh, you do need to get the patient's consent for disclosing uh, telehealth records to a patient's primary encounter. And this must be asked. This must be asked of the patient at each encounter that you basically are going to disclose the telehealth record to their primary physician, and this should be documented uh, in the record. Clearly, any disruption secondary to equipment failure and even patient feedback is important because if you get a positive feedback, then if the patient complains sometime later about the telemedicine encounter, um, it, it's nice to show that when you when you did ask the patient about his or her feedback and they came back to you with a positive uh, response, you know, now, now a year later, they're coming back with a negative allegation. Well, that's obviously inconsistent. And again, the telemedicine record, this is just the last slide because, again, I'm not sure how applicable this is to many of you. You know, there has to be integrity and reliability. It's important that the doctor at the remote location uh, has a, uh, a high uh, a medical record of high integrity and reliability, so that would ensure a correct diagnosis and treatment that is important for patient safety. Um, again, obviously, the record has to be made available, has to be retained and maintained, privacy and security, just like traditional records, and there should be quality review, uh, making sure that the equipment, that the connectivity is all appropriate, that there's patient and physician satisfaction, and also an assessment that the, that the encounter by telemedicine was appropriate and, and certainly as appropriate as a, as a physical encounter. So again, you, when you prepare your medical record, you must think defensively. Um, again, be very, very careful with templates because I had mentioned earlier, they do box you in in some way. And again, the goal is to prepare a record that not only documents, you know, what you do for the patient and why you're doing what you're doing for the patient, but a record that can help you in audits, complaints, investigations, and lawsuits. You know, back in the old days when you heard of defensive medicine, uh, it focused more on the tests, on the procedures. Um, my opinion that defensive medicine really should focus more on the on the medical record keeping and that you should have a, uh, a complete note. With EMR, uh, we have the same issues. I mean, content, maintenance, um, retention, privacy, confidentiality, HIPAA, all these things apply to EMR. Um, a lot of times, you know, uh, doctors will tell me or office managers will tell me that they're in the process of uh, scanning paper records into their EMR system. And again, the one thing I, I, I always remind them is that many, many times when I find out that a, uh, a practice scanned their old paper records into uh, the computer and subsequently destroyed the paper records because they felt they didn't need them anymore, and then I look at their at the I look at the uh, scanned records. I notice that I only have every odd page or every even page. And then when I ask the provider, when I ask the the office, well, why is it I only have odd and even? Suddenly they realize that they forgot to scan the other side of the page. Um, so they, you know, again, if you if you have double sided pages, you got to make sure you you scan both sides of the page. You don't want to end up with pages one, three, five, and seven. Um, that's a bad idea. Um, and also, if you have post its on your paper records. Remember to take off those post-its because if you leave them on and you scan, you're going to have these white squares all over the place. And if you don't have a complete medical record, not only is that not good for your patient, and not only is that not good if you're all of a sudden being audited or investigated that you don't have a complete record, but you are in violation of the state retention laws because you have not maintained and retained a complete uh, record. So again, and, and of course with EMR, uh, you need to have backup, and that's something you would have to discuss with your EMR company. And again, we don't like cloning as we had discussed earlier. So again, this is a slide I just put in, uh, you know, very, very quickly just to let people know that if you are dealing with uh, vendors, um, just be uh, careful. Most of the vendor contracts out there are written in a very, very, in a manner that is very, very friendly to the vendor. Uh, so for example, if there are errors or omissions, uh, who has responsibility? The vendor really has none under most of these contracts. If there's a limitation, there are limitation of liability provisions means that if all of a sudden the EMR does something bad and you want to now sue the EMR company, the liability of that EMR company is limited to a certain amount, maybe 12 months of the fees that you paid. Now, if you're only paying $1,000 a month, that means you may have a situation where that, that defective EMR could have caused ten dollars or $100,000 worth of damages when you're being investigated, but you could only go after the EMR company for 12 months of fees paid, and in my hypothetical, $12,000. What does that do for you? Indemnification and hold harmless provisions, you would think that the EMR company would indemnify you, would, would make you whole, would hold you harmless in the contract, but usually it's the other way around. Usually you have to indemnify the EMR company and hold them harmless. Um, again, these are provisions that you have to focus on. 
I know a lot of times you'll hear that they're standard, but you should question them or at least find out if they, we can make them mutual. Um, implementation, you know, you need to know if, 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 if your EMR is being implemented. You need to know exactly the timing, the who, what, when, and where of the implementation. And similarly, if you have technical assistance provisions, you want to know is the technical assistance going to be provided live? Is it going to be on the telephone? What level of technical assistance? Are there any limitations? What is the cost? Are there different levels of cost? When is it going to happen? These are all questions you need to ask, and these are questions that should be somehow memorialized in your contract. And very, very critical is what happens if you terminate the contract, even if you have a dispute with the EMR company. Obviously, if you're terminating a contract, you probably are terminating because you are not happy with the EMR company, and there may be some dispute. Maybe you're withholding uh, money because they haven't done their job, and now you don't want to pay them. Or, But what's critical is that you must make sure that your contract with your EMR company basically allows you to get your confidential information back or transfer to a new EMR vendor in a timely manner, um, in a format that you and your vendor want, whether that's hard copy, whether that's electronic, okay, there must you must have the ability to have complete access and the ability to transfer these records or this information over to a new vendor, okay? And that's regardless of the cause of termination. So whether you're terminating, they're terminating, whether there's a dispute or not, that has to be in the contract. Very, very important. Use of email, we see a lot of people doing email, we see a lot of people using texts. Um, I'm not a big fan of texting. I think texting is, a, is a, at least right now, is problematic. Uh, lots of people leave their phone somewhere, the text you know, shows, somebody can read the text you know, who's not really authorized. So I'm not a big fan of texting. Um, oh, there's also an issue of security in terms of encryption. Whereas email, you, know, you could have encrypted emails. Emails are something where, just like I use emails with my, with my clients, um, you could use email with patients, but again, there has to be there has to be an understanding between you and the patient as to how this email could be used. The, you have to make the patient understand and have reasonable expectations as to how the email could be used. So for one thing, certainly the email should not be used for emergency or urgent situations. So there must be some sort of a disclaimer. So uh, you know, and usually what I do is I, I usually prepare an email contract between the practice and the patient that identifies really how emails can be used. Um, based on the slide, for example, and so this way it, um, the patient understands what exactly are the, the, the scope of the email and what the email will not entail. So clearly, if, if there's an emergency or urgent situation, you, go, you call 911, go to the ER, email is not appropriate. Uh, only certain authorized individuals who should be identified by name to the, to the doctor, they are the only ones who could be sending and receiving messages. Um, Certain topics can be addressed in an email. Certain topics are not appropriate. So what are not appropriate? Certainly topics such as drug and alcohol uh, treatment, uh, AIDS and HIV, psych and mental illness, uh, information relating to minors. Uh, these are high-level, as, as most of you know, these are high-level confidential issues um, that really should not be discussed in an email because at the end of the day, you, you don't know where the email may go or the email may be inadvertently sent somewhere else. And, and now, basically, you've just disclosed some very, very highly volatile uh, PHI. Uh, so maybe follow-up appointments, that, that's something that can be done in email. Prescriptions, you know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you're dealing with the prescriptions that involve, you know, um, HIV and AIDS or mental illness, you know, I don't think that should be part of an email. Um, so again, you have to be very, very careful what you include. Um, and response times should be included in your, in your discussion with patients so that, you know, they have to understand these are non-urgent issues. Um, and that you're responding it could be, it could maybe take a day, it could maybe take three days, maybe up to a week, depending on what it is. But, you know, uh, patients have the expectation, the unreasonable expectation, that if they send you an email um, about something very, very important at 11 o'clock at night, you will respond at 11.05. And that's a bad idea for a, a, a bunch of reasons. For one thing, uh, it, you may need more time than five minutes to respond. Also, maybe you shouldn't be responding via email in terms of what you're dealing with. And... Um, you know, and, and again, you know, I think these are things that you really need to think about ahead of time. And of course, retention, you know, your email should be part of the record. And again, today, many EMR systems actually are, you know, uh, they, they are uh, coded in, in a certain way uh, where any emails between pa uh, physician and patient um, is, um, is automatically incorporated into the uh, electronic medical record. Uh, errors, you know, I'll just go through this quickly, you know, again, um, you know, obviously in the old days when you had paper records, there was a certain way to correct errors. Um, today with EMR, now you do addendums and, and clearly the EMR uh, doesn't uh, let you um, delete old records. I mean, there's, there's an audit trail. Um, so it's okay if there's a mistake. 
um, but you, you do an addendum, you identify the record that you are uh, uh, amending, um, and you, 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 you basically date your, your addendum and you describe why, you know, when I review the, the patient record a week later or two weeks later on the, or on a subsequent visit, I notice that the record said X, Y, and Z, and I'm, 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 you know, and I'm correcting X and Y um, because uh, they are, they are, uh, it wasn't memorialized correctly. It's okay to make mistakes, it's just how you correct the mistakes are very important. Ownership issues, people always ask me who own the medical records, do the doctors own the records? And the answer is no, uh, the doctors do not own the records. Um, it is the practice that owns the records. So if a, if, a, if, a, if a doctor leaves the practice, they cannot just take the patient records with them. Um, that, that is owned by the practice. And certainly if a patient wants to follow that doctor to his or her new practice, then they have to write a letter to the practice saying, you know, Dr. Smith, I noticed Dr. Smith is no longer with you. I noticed now he joined this new group. I'd like to transfer my care to his um, you know, to his new practice. That doesn't, by the way, prevent you from trying to keep the patient. Obviously, you can't say anything disparaging about Dr. Smith, um, but you certainly can say, look, I realize Dr. Smith has left the practice. You've been a very valuable patient uh, in our practice for many years. We have many other doctors who you may have even seen when Dr. Smith was on vacation or for whatever reason he was not around. Uh, we'd love to have you stay with us. And, um, you know, there's no reason why you can't say those things, uh, but certainly you do have to let them know to the extent you have the information where Dr. Smith is uh, because you can't be you can't be seen as preventing the continuity of care of that patient, and so um, so so you, you don't say anything disparaging or anything adverse about Dr. Smith. You have to tell the patient to the extent you know where Dr. Smith is, how they can reach Dr. Smith. But at the same time, you certainly can market your own practice and try to keep the patient um, you know um, in your practice. Again, providing originals. You know, if somebody asks you to send a, a record over to somebody. Uh, never provide the originals. Uh, again, with EMR, not so much an issue anymore because there really is no original, but, but there are still uh, enough people out there who have uh, paper records and um, never give the originals because, again, if you make a copy and the copy is not complete, uh, then you're left with an incomplete record and, uh, and that, that results in the problems we discuss. I always uh, caution the physicians to give uh, copies of the medical records. Um, retention of records, you know, again, under uh, Connecticut law, seven years, uh, you know, from the last uh, uh, treatment. Um, uh, the, the law has other things for, you know, tax slides and x-rays and lab and uh, other types of reports. But I always tell, I always tell the, uh, the doctors uh, or the practice to re retain the records for a minimum of, of seven years. Seven years is a, uh, is a minimum. Um, if you look, you know, again, if you are being sued or you are being audited, uh, or you are being investigated, those records should be kept until the end of the litigation, audit, or investigation, even uh, until everything is fully resolved, even if you are uh, beyond the seven years, okay? So you want to keep them, and, um, and you should sequester them. You, sh you should put them aside because lots of times they are kept with the regular records. All of a sudden, seven years passes, the doctor throws out the records, and now all of a sudden, you know, somebody says, wait a minute, you knew there was a litigation, you knew that this was being audited, and why did you throw them out? Believe it or not, it does happen enough times where, um, you know, we, uh, we, we, we should mention that um, in, our, in, in our program. Um, I'm always asked, uh, selling a practice, dying or retiring, again, um, you know, if a physician uh, dies or retires, and under Connecticut law, there has to be notice. Um, um, what happens if you sell a practice? That could be obviously a, a topic of its own. But what happens if you want to terminate the physician-patient relationship? Can you do that? And the answer is, of course you can, but it must be done in a certain way to avoid a claim of either abandonment or discrimination. So the timing is critical. Uh, the patient must be in a stable condition. The patient cannot be in an acute um, uh, situation. Um, you sit down with the patient. You explain to the patient why this relationship isn't working out, either because they're not compliant or perhaps they're not behaving appropriately um, you know, in some way, and you have this uh, conversation witnessed, and um, you follow this up with a, a certified letter that you are obviously going to keep in your medical record and you basically tell the patient both in the in the in the in the, in the meeting as well as in the record that you are still there for any urgent reasons for 30 days um they should be going to other physicians for follow-up uh you should explain why the follow-up is important and that if you do this and when they go to a new physician you would be more than happy to transfer the records uh to the new doctor in the in the letter i would not necessarily write why they why the the the, the patient is being terminated patients when they read uh, reasons why they're being terminated to become a little bit more hostile, uh, although that should be part of your discussion with the patient if you decide to have a discussion with the patient. Um, and again, I always caution doctors never to refer the patient to another doctor uh, because frankly, if you found that this patient was problematic and you terminated the relationship, 
why uh, why send them somewhere else? Access to records, again, um, they should be, you know, given to qualified persons. Any request should be in writing and, and again, made part of the medical record. Uh, you can charge for copying. Um, you cannot deny access to patients that don't pay. So if you have a patient who's not paying for the for the visits, and you know, you cannot say, oh, by the way, since um, this guy is a skin flint, you know, I'm not going to I'm not I'm not going to basically uh, uh, provide him or her with access to the records. That cannot be done. You have to, you know, uh, patients by law are entitled to uh, to access of their records, and notwithstanding the fact that they're non-paying, um, you know, they um, they should be given access to their records. And again, if the, if for whatever reason you are disclosing records to anybody, including a patient or anyone other than a patient, or you are not going to disclose the records, all of that should be documented. All disclosures and denials of disclosure uh, should be documented. If somebody is asking for records and they're not the patient and they're telling you that they're either uh, a parent or, or, they're, an, uh, or they're, um, they're a guardian or they're, uh, uh, they were appointed by the probate court, uh, they're an executor, uh, particularly, you know, court-appointed individuals or, you know, um, you ask for documentation, ask for proof, you know, maybe call up the patient and say, by the way, I have this, you know, Mr. Jones is claiming that, you know, he, um, you know, uh, um, you know, he has, he's qualified basically to ask for a copy of your record. Is that true? Now, granted, sometimes in your, in your, in your, um, uh, in your forms, you may have already asked the patient who is authorized to ask for copies of your records and maybe that person is already listed. That's fine, but in case they're not, then, you know, it's always good to confirm who these people are and document that. Um, and again, when you, when, you give, when, you, when you provide a copy of the record, always review the record to see if there's any highly confidential information in there, um, if there's HIV and AIDS related information, if there is a drug and alcohol, maybe that information doesn't have to be provided for that particular request and maybe should be redacted. So that's something to talk to your lawyer about. Um, you know, about whether you disclose the entire record, but always look over records. We've had a situation where a doctor, a surgeon um, uh, did surgery. The surgery was subject to QA and uh, quality assurance in the hospital, which came back negative. And the doctor actually kept the report in the record. And that record, including the QA report, was actually disclosed um, to the patient who then turned it over to the attorney. So since I do want to give time for questions, um, again, you can... Uh, uh, deny access under certain conditions, and, a and again, always ask for special releases when you're dealing with certain, you know, types of disclosures of the highly confidential types of treatment. Again, we discussed that patients under HIPAA and under state law uh, may have certain rights. And again, for your practice, it's always important to have reasonable security measures, whether they're um, administrative or whether they are, and these are some of the administrative measures, or whether they're physical or whether they're technical. Uh, again, what's what's reasonable today may not be reasonable. Uh, two years from now, you know, technology is, is advancing at a, at a very, very rapid rate. And so, therefore, you have to make sure that whatever you have today um, is, um, is, is reasonable tomorrow. Authorizations, again, if you are marketing, if you're, if you're basically are, you know, showing pictures of your patients on your website, obviously, you need to get uh, patient consent um, and, and in writing. So, again, to protect your practice, you probably already have privacy plans and privacy notice and, and BAs. But you should have internal contracts with all of your employees uh, to make sure they maintain the confidentiality and they will comply with federal and state law. And you should have compliance plans in place for privacy, billing, fraud, and abuse because um, the OIG and law enforcement has indicated uh, that um, by having such plans, it could mitigate uh, the penalties. Um, but again, um, don't create plans to put them on a bookshelf you know, in your office, if you do create a plan, a compliance plan, then make sure that you are enforcing it and you're complying. So, you know, educate your professionals, educate the staff, um, you know, work with billing personnel to make sure that, you know, that claims are being reviewed, conduct internal audits. Now, now this is important um, because, again, if you conduct an internal audit and you find something problematic, you may be triggering a self-disclosure requirement that you may have to disclose something to a third-party payer or to somebody else. So it's always a good idea that before you decide to do an internal audit, again, consult with your with counsel uh, because if you do uh, activate a, a disclosure requirement, then suddenly now you, you, you may be telling the third party payer, by the way, I found that you overpaid me uh, because we did X and Y, and now the third party payer can come in and do a grand audit of your entire practice, and you, you'll know they'll find something else. So um, even though the benefits of, of doing these self audits could be in reducing penalties and sanctions, the risks that you're taking is that it could widen the audit, so you have to be very, very careful. And again, when you monitor and correct problems, you want to have open communications. Uh, no retaliation. You want to make sure you have a consistent uh, process. 
So now, um, um, if we have any questions, um, let's see. Okay, so somebody did ask whether the slides we mail to us. The answer is yes. Um, could telephone conversations with patients be recorded? Um, good question. I mean, in, in, uh, first of all, um, you know, you always, you, you always need to advise uh, the patients uh, that, uh, you know, for quality reasons, uh, uh, conversations could be recorded. Um, but that's something basically that, um, uh, you know, we can, we can get back to that and find out if that should be also in the patient consent form or in the, uh, in the, in the forms. Uh, that you notify patients that their uh, conversations may be recorded for quality assurance purposes. Um, okay, the area, uh, some, so somebody apparently is interested in telemedicine and they're, area, they're asking about areas of exposure. Uh, certainly medical malpractice is, a, is, is an issue and I think the informed consent is very, very important uh, in your medical record to make sure uh, that, um, uh, that you inform the patient of the the risks and the benefits of the telemedicine encounter. You want to make sure the coordination of care, as we had mentioned earlier, is um, is well documented in the in the medical record. If there was any disruption of the of the encounter, memorialize that. This way, again, you have a contemporaneous note. And again, to the extent you get patient feedback, as we had mentioned earlier on, that's very very important. Uh, another question is, you know, about keeping medical records. You know, with seven years. Um, um, the maximum note, seven years is the minimum. Um, you know, we typically actually suggest that patients keep the records for, first of all, with EMR, that may not be a, a, so important an issue anymore because EMR can now be maintained for forever. Um, but, you know, we suggest that if you have paper records that for a minimum of 10 years, because the statute of limitations for fraud is a 10 year statute of limitations. Also with minors, you know, uh, the question is, do you keep them even beyond that? Because, you know, New York, for example, requires, you know, their doctors to keep records for a minimum of six years, or in the case of a minor, um, uh, at least one year after they turn 21, whichever is longer. So, um, so you know, in, in New York, for a minor, you could be keeping pay, uh, records for, for quite a number of years. And again, we, we, we always counsel uh, doctors that when they're dealing with minors to keep the records for even longer, perhaps in the 10 years. Uh, but again, with EMR, uh, that is not uh, uh, much of an issue. Um, I'm asked here about um, uh, how much can you bill for EMR copying? Well, you can bill, uh, you know, actually uh, uh, Mark Thompson and I did actually inquire from the uh, DPH whether, um, you know, you, you could bill for medical record copying on electronic medical records. Um, and, and, and the statutes are silent, but, you know, the, 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 uh, the word that we got from them was that it was appropriate. But to my understanding, you know, um, if you are basically um, loading medical records onto a CD. Um, I think the charge under HIPAA is $6.50 per CD or the actual cost if they are higher. Um, and, and that's per medical record request. But the, if, the, if, the, if the actual costs are higher, then they must be uh, substantiated. Uh, so for example, if you're using an encrypted CD, an encrypted CD may cost more than, than $6.50. So that could be an example of an actual cost uh, that um, you know um, would justify a rate higher than um, uh, than than just the 650. Um, okay, so uh, I am uh, one uh, question that I'm being asked here um, is um, you know um, medical records basically. Let's see. Okay, about minors. So really, you know, uh, can a parent you know access records uh, of a minor? And the answer is you know generally most of the time they can, but. There are, by law in Connecticut, there are there are circumstances where uh, parents are not entitled necessarily to inspect, and that's you know if the if the doctor feels that the parent may be uh, you know abusing or neglecting the minor, or if the, if the child is no longer a minor under the law, or if the child is a minor but emancipated, but also you know if, if the information is relating to certain diagnoses and treatments uh, that do not require the parental consent, so that could be some of the high ticket items such as HIV and AIDS, uh, STDs, mental health, drug and alcohol dependence. Um, and things like um, abortion. Um, so again, um, um, we are now past our, our, our one o'clock. So typically, people get angry with me if I go past uh, the, the deadline. So again, you should have my um, information uh, on the on the slides. You know, feel free to give me a call. 
um, or send me an email. Um, I actually prefer a call if that's uh, good for you because then we can have an actual discussion and, um, and I'll answer any questions that you have um, and, and assist you any way I can. So again, on behalf of myself, on behalf of uh, Garfunkel Wild, on behalf of uh, the Fairfield County Medical Association, uh, thank you very, very much for attending today's program. Okay. What did you think? That was good. <laughs> you did pretty good. And you got a lot of...